Hi, my name is Joel Neider. I'm from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And this is about a project that I've been working on with Craig Mustard, uh, Andrada Zoltan, and Alexandra Fedorova, that most of you know as Sasha. So this is a very interesting story about an idea that we had and what we did with it. So what was the idea? Well, we heard about this company that started to produce this new hardware that was called PIM, Processing in Memory. And the PIM is meant to embed small processors inside DRAM. So we thought, well, what would happen if we took this PIM architecture and applied it to storage class memory? So the idea is very simple, that you take some kind of processor and you embed it inside the non-volatile RAM, the storage class memory, uh, so that we can process data in place. Now, you might ask, well, why would you want to do that? Well, that is a good question. So here we can see a bunch of storage devices. And you can see that as the technology improves, the latency of the device uh, gets reduced. And not just the latency is reduced, but then the relative processing time to process the data increases. And it increases to a point where the processing time overtakes the device latency. So then it becomes very critical that we can process the, d the data as close as possible to the source uh, so that we can reduce our processing time. If we have to spend a lot of time moving data around, it's going to take way too long, and this is going to become the bottleneck in our system. So here you can see uh, the hierarchy of different storage devices. At the top, you can see that we have our persistent devices, and at the bottom, the volatile ones. Uh, different work in the past have proposed to embed processing in every one of these levels in the storage hierarchy, except the one in the middle, which stands out, which is storage class memory. That's the one we're talking about today. Now this one is especially critical because you can see it is the lowest latency of the persistent storage devices. And in fact, um, its characteristics are not that much different from DRAM in terms of latency and throughput. So it's quite critical that we be able to process data inside storage class memory. So what does this mean? Well, we want to be able to improve the performance of our software applications by taking advantage of this new technology of embedding these DPUs, these small processors, inside storage class memory. Well, what kind of benefits can we see if we do that? Well, first of all, we've got this shared memory bus. Right? Today it's uh, DDR4. Tomorrow might be something else. But the point is that in order to process data by the CPU, all data must move across this shared bus. That means it's a resource that's subject to contention. Uh, if we can reduce the contention, then we can improve performance. The CPU is also another expensive resource. Most modern CPUs are out of order processors, superscalar, uh, with very high frequencies. These processors are good at uh, high throughput on single threaded applications. Uh, but are not very good for highly parallel applications. That's why people go to GPUs and other architectures for parallel applications. If we can free up the CPU uh, for the expensive software that needs it, uh, we can do that by offloading certain simple operations, and very highly parallel operations, to the memory itself. So how can we free up the memory bus and the CPU? Well, the DPU and the storage are tightly coupled, meaning that there's a high number of DPUs for the storage. And they all have their own individual buses, which means the DPU can access the memory directly and does not have to rely on the shared memory bus or on the CPU for processing. So our job is to figure out how to offload the correct operations in order to take advantage of this architecture. A second benefit is that we get scalable processing. Well, what does that mean? Let's look over here on the top right at 
core density. So the core density is the ratio between DPUs to storage. Here we've set it at one DPU to every four gigabytes of data. So as the DPU count increases, the storage also increases. And because they increase together, the ratio stays the same. It means that we can continue to process data at scale even though our uh, storage is increasing. And that's something that we can't do with a traditional storage system. Another benefit is that we can continue to process data after it's become durable. So once an application writes data to storage, it expects that it's going to be stable and that it can retrieve the data later. It means that it's safe. Now, once it's inside the storage class memory, we can continue to process the data as long as it doesn't violate this guarantee of durability. Then we don't have to use the memory bus and we don't have to see, use the CPU and we can improve throughput of the application. But the design of PIM is not set in stone. If we look through the literature, there's many different design points. So here I'd like to highlight four of them, the ones that uh, we feel are the most important. The first one is inter-PIM communication. So this uh, assumes that there's some kind of secondary bus that allows all of these little processors to talk to each other. So that would be very useful uh, for applications such as matrix multiplication, where there's some kind of shuffle step in the algorithm. Right? Data from one DPU has to be reallocated and distributed to the other DPUs. Uh, another point is address translation. The DPUs see a very narrow view of the world, and they see the physical memory. If we were able to have virtual memory, subsystem, then we could share pointers between the host and the DPU. The third point is the instruction set architecture, which basically means which instructions do these DPUs allow, or do they know how to execute. So this matters mostly for compilers and for time that it would take an engineer to learn the new architecture. The fourth point is the core density. So when we look at the ratio of DPUs to memory, that's what we call the core density. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we learned about this company from France called Upmem that is now producing these things uh, for DRAM. And we talked to them and we worked with some of their hardware to see what it can do. So let's take a look at how they fit into, this, uh, into these design points that I talked about earlier. So first of all, these are drop-in replacements for DDR4 DIMMs. Uh, the DPUs are general purpose processors and uh, they've produced a compiler, uh, a port of LLVM. There is one DPU for each bank of 64 megabytes. That's their core density. But there's also a 64K private SRAM buffer for each DPU. Um, each DPU cannot access its DRAM directly. It must use a small embedded DMA engine to move the data from the DRAM into the SRAM buffer before it can be processed. That means that there's some latency when we want to access a new buffer, uh, which means that uh, we have to wait for the DMA, which introduces some latency. So they have a pipeline um, that works in an interleaved multi-threading architecture. Basically, there's a large number of hardware threads where each thread can progress, uh, one thread can progress at each clock cycle, uh, which can be used to keep the pipeline full. And the final interesting point is that the data is interleaved across multiple banks, as is common in DDR memory, in order to uh, hide latency. Here you can see how that works. On the bottom right, we have our input stream, which is basically the English alphabet. And on the bottom left, you can see the view that each DPU sees in its physical memory. So as we read bytes, uh, every eighth byte is striped across the different banks. And so each DPU sees only every eighth byte uh, in its physical memory. That means we must take care in software to transpose the data in order that each DPU see the correct view, a coherent view of the world. 
Well, we wanted to measure the raw throughput of the system to see what kind of performance we could expect. So we took a system with nine ranks of 64 DPUs each for a total of 576 DPUs. Now, each DPU had access to 64 megabytes of memory for a total of 36 gigabytes of DRAM. We programmed all of the DPUs to move their memory simultaneously, and we were able to move all 36 gigabytes in 0.16 seconds, which gave us uh, an approximate throughput of 250 gigabytes per second. Now, if we compare that to a standard DDR4 2400 channel uh, with a top speed of 19 gigabytes per second, you can see that there is a huge performance gain that we can have. Uh, our trick is to learn how to realize that gain. We also wanted to experiment with algorithms to see where is the cutoff point of where we could expect throughput gains. So we used the snappy compression algorithm. Uh, actually, this is using uh, decompression. And you can see that we can get up to a 4.5 uh, times improvement over the host CPU uh, by using a large number of DPUs um, and also large file sizes. And you can see that the large file sizes are important in order to get the high level of parallelism needed in order to outperform the CPU. So you can see as the size of the file decreases, the parallelism decreases, and the benefit gets smaller, and in some cases even becomes a loss. So while we were doing these experiments, we also thought of a bunch of different features which, if they were included, in future PIM on SCM that they would be advantageous. So the first one is the data triggered functions. So basically a data triggered function is that we would be able to, the host CPU would be able to write to a, a non-existent address inside the memory. The memory would recognize that as a trigger to run a function. When it finished uh, executing the function, it would then return the data to the host. So the host would basically stall while waiting for the results from that data. Uh, there are other existing systems that have implemented a similar idea, and we believe that that would be beneficial for this kind of system. Second one is concurrent memory access. As we mentioned, currently it is not possible to uh, access the DRAM from the host and from the DPU simultaneously, although it would be nice if we were able to do that. Having a mix of memory types is also quite important um, because it will allow us to have a small amount of DRAM along with our storage class memory um, because we don't want to store all data. There might be intermediate calculations or things like cryptographic keys that we do not want to have stored. And the fourth point is the importance of tuning the system for performance because, as we all know, a system is only good as its weakest point, and therefore it's very important in order to balance the throughput of all the components in the system. So for our future directions, uh, we'd also like to look at regular expression search, uh, text search, free text search, uh, as well as hyperdimensional computing. And we expect that there are many more interesting use cases out there. And if you have any ideas, please talk to us. So thank you for watching. Uh, here you can see uh, our contact information. If you have any questions or interests or comments, we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out. Thanks.